Well, Teresa McKnight, thank you so much for joining us. It, what a treat to have you. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah. So, so we, we have gone through a lot of our vice presidents and, um, and started with the trustees and just a, a variety of uh, individuals on campus, but now we're getting a little broader look at uh, 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 at the community, which is so important. And of course, you're the, the director of Ready, so the, uh, the Regional Economic Development uh, or Eastern Idaho. It doesn't, <laughs> quite, it doesn't <laughs> quite spell Ready, so I never can quite get it, but that's pretty close <laughs> to what, what you do. And you're the director for that. So one of the things I like to do, because uh, um, especially for someone like you from the outside, you'd be relatively new to our faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. So sure. why, don't you, why don't you give us the five minute who Teresa McKnight is? Okay, I can certainly do that. I'm not sure whether to talk to you directly or you, to you talk can, into the camera. You can, so do, just, you can do both. Just you know? tell me which. I can never be a news anchor. It'd be very <laughs> difficult to follow the camera. So <laughs> this will be a little tricky, but uh, just a little background about uh, who I am. Um, and where I come from. I, I was one of three children uh, born into the Wynn family and um, I'm the baby of the family. I've got two older brothers, a brother that's five years older than me and one that's seven years older than me. And my dad was a, a technician for Mountain Bell that then sold out to AT&T. My mom worked for the Internal Revenue Service. Mm -hmm. Our family loved the outdoors and so we loved to camp and fish. And we went on, each one of us had motorcycles including my mother. So we'd motorcycle the mountains of Utah. Um, and then we also snowmobiled in Utah and up in Yellowstone uh, several times a year. So it was just- um, So this is home. Very, very out. Yeah. So this, this area is very um, known to me because I have spent a lot of time, um, you know, from, from just enjoying life. I was a tomboy. I had to be a tomboy because I had two older brothers. So to survive life with two older brothers, you become tough over time. And so that kind of made me who I am today. Um, I was the first in our family to receive a university degree and I started my career in accounting in high school. So I was, uh, because I had enough credits in high school to graduate, then I only had to go for a few hours in the morning and I was released at 1130 to go out and advance my career. So right. my stage of life of what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so I actually um, worked for an accounting firm, which I had several clients that were assigned to me. So that's what I was doing during high school. I worked for the accounting firm from 12 noon until 5 p.m. And then I went to work for Kentucky Fried Chicken where I was training to be a manager. Um, and eventually the goal was there is that I would um, um, own a franchise over time. My brother was very involved. He was um, owned several stores, Kentucky Fried Chicken stores in Salt Lake City. He wanted me to follow his path. And so that's what I was doing. I'd go to school in the morning, work for the accounting firm from 12 mm -hmm. to five, and then from five until uh, whenever we closed the store and got things cleaned up, um, I would go home at night and start the next day um, over again. Um, I, I, uh, I did, uh, after I graduated from high school, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I felt like the path was to go ahead and get out into the career world and kind of seek my path and then go back and get my education so that I was completely directed with my educational course rather than being the standard freshman and going in and saying, I don't know what I want to be when, when I grow up. Let's try this. Let's try this. I, I didn't want to take that path. Um, right. And so I kind of did a little backwards and I did end up uh, marrying my high school sweetheart, which uh, two years after we were married, we had our first daughter. And then four years after that, we had our son. And today from that, uh, both married and we've got six grand babies. I did have an opportunity to work as a cost accountant at Pepperidge Farm. So I I went to work where I tracked from the time the ingredients were delivered and the packaging to when the product was being produced on the production line to when it was actually um, made into a product and then shipped out. So I tracked the whole process, which included doing a monthly inventory um, of all of those pieces. And so it was just a really fun job. But a friend came to me and said, there's a new position that's opening up at Utah State within the instructional technology department um, and just the way that the position was described to me under uh, an individual called Dr. David Merrill. So if you're in instructional design, instructional technology, you know Dr. David Merrill very well because of his instructional theory concepts. But it just sounded very intriguing to me. And so I decided to, to uh, take the position and they allowed me to go back to school and finish my degree because I already had enough credits um, from my general ed. So right. I went in 
finish that. Um, from there, we spun off a private company through the research being conducted. I ran the company, worked for the university, ran the company at night, uh, took personal vacation to travel around the United States to trade shows mm -hmm. to sell our product. Uh, it was the first electronic textbook developed in 91. Um, and we hit that fork in the road as a startup company where the mastermind behind the technology, Dr. Merrill, was a full tenure professor. He was close to retirement. He didn't want to retire and run a company, so he sold the technology or licensed the technology to a Fortune 500 company. And uh, from there, the technology transfer director, who was also the director of the research park, says, I want you on my team. And that's where my career started in research parks and economic development. Once I made that transition, boy, I latched on and I knew that's where I wanted to take um, my path. So from there, um, I spent 15 years at Utah State and uh, I had presentations that I made across the United States at various conferences on research parks. And that's when South Dakota mm -hmm. came knocking to develop the first research park in South Dakota. I was there for five years, got four buildings in the ground, raised about $30 million, had over 20 companies and research groups in the park. So it was stabilized and ready for someone else to come in and pick it up from where I left out. Went to Montana State because that's where I was recruited. Um, redeveloped a failing research park for 27 years. It was in the red, got it in the black, uh, cleaned up the legal problems. We were getting ready to break ground when the university decided we're launching a campaign, mm -hmm. um, a fundraising campaign. So we want to put the research park on hold for six to 12 months. Well, I don't sit around. It just drives me crazy to sit around. So uh, at that same time, the state of Utah came knocking and um, I went to work for the state of Utah. And the goal of that position was to re do regional economic development, but to create state owned research um, incubators, excuse me, across the state of Utah. And so the first project that um, I designed and developed for the state was the Innovation Center outside the West Gates of Hill Air Force Base. And what right. was exciting about that project was um, I actually had the opportunity to work with um, the Air Force. So um, I had security clearance to get behind the wire. And uh, I, I um, had the opportunity to meet General Levy, who was over three sustainment centers, which included Hill Air Force Base. And uh, through that relationship, uh, we were able to negotiate the first of its kind partnership agreement between the state of Utah and the United States Air Force for them to come over and do reverse engineering and rapid prototyping to make parts on aging equipment they could no longer um, sure. get parts for. Right. So um, from there, uh, that program, um, the executive director of the program at the time was having some personal issues and the, um, the, the program started to, to go into a, a rabbit hole, a deep rabbit hole, and legislators were starting to take notice of what was going on with the program. And of course, I didn't want to be associated with a program that was going to go into a black hole. Right. And so I left, finished my MBA. And at that time, um, after finishing the MBA, then I had multiple job offers. One of them was here. Mm -hmm. And I decided that this was the place I needed to be. It was just uh, all the responsibilities aligned to where my goals were. So, so we're, we're really glad to have you. And, and actually, uh, it, it's important for everyone listening, watching, to know the background you've got. Because this is, we're, we're sitting at a unique time in, in, in life, right? And you and right. I, along with, I don't know, it was maybe 15 of us went uh, uh, back to Aiken, Georgia to, to see Plant Vogel, which uh, is, is part of the um, um, nuclear, uh, maybe sometimes it's called nuclear renaissance, but <laughs> there's a lot of interesting things going here. And, and you, you've got a, a, a litany of background. We'll try to try to touch on many of those, but Let's start with Ready. So mm -hmm. we, in, in common, we have Park Price uh, as uh, Park doesn't have enough to do with his free time. So he's the, <laughs> the chair of Ready as well. So we, we, both, uh, mm -hmm. we both work for him. And let's not reflect on him, but let's, <laughs> let's talk about uh, what Ready does sure. and, and kind of uh, how that works, because it's quite unique. And you are certainly herding cats. So why, why don't you talk a little bit about Ready? You bet. There's definitely a lot of moving parts, which makes it really exciting. Sure. And I think that's what's so fun about economic development. Development, not just 
economic development for a city, but from a region. Right. So Ready covers 14 counties. We cover from the Utah-Idaho border, Oneida County, clear up to the Idaho-Montana border, which is Teton County, mm -hmm. and then everything from the, the east and the west. So Montpelier, Garden City, over to Sun Valley, Stanley, Chalice. So we have a very long area um, that, that we work with leadership um, on regional economic development issues. But Ready was created in 2015, and the purpose was to connect businesses to resources for growth and to build relationships, help nurture those relationships to build uh, world-class sectors here in Eastern Idaho. If we fast forward to today of where Ready is right now, Ready has three different buckets I'm gonna talk about that we focus on. The first bucket that we focus on is business retention and expansion. So mm -hmm. we want to take care of our own, those that exist here in our region and help them um, to do well in business and to be able to expand their business. So exactly. first and foremost, that's what our focus is on. Then, of course, the other piece of that is business recruitment. We want to bring new businesses in to stimulate the economy. When you do economic development, you don't want all of your eggs in one basket. You want to have multiple opportunities in which if we have a down economy and it hits one or two sectors, then you've got the rest of the sectors that can pull us out of that recession and, and that you know bad economy that's going on. And so that's why it's really wise to make sure that you diversify your economy and you have multiple sectors that you're focused on. Yep. Um, the, the second bucket, so to speak, is workforce development, training, and education. Uh -huh. And that's where CEI um, comes into play is because you folks are a big player in responding to the marketplace in regards to not only the current workforce, but the workforce of tomorrow. And so that's... That, this is perfect. So you're really, you're really teeing this up for Michelle. So that's, <laughs> that's wonderful. And then the third bucket is when we talk about diversifying our economy. We also talk about um, enhancement of research and entrepreneurship. That is a key factor because when we look at when a recession hits or when something goes wrong, it's usually the big corporations that are affected the most and they downsize, they close their operations in different areas, lay people off where the startup companies, these small businesses really are the heart and soul of America. And they help to kind of bring us through those bad times. Uh, their survival rates are a little higher than the big corporations. Um, and so it's important for us to uh, twofold in that third bucket. Number one, we want to make sure that the research that's going on within our university systems has the ability uh, to transfer outside of that university. So when we look at the analogy, it's a push and pull effect. The university is developing the technology and the private sector is standing at the door waiting to pull it out into their hands or into the hands of the private sector in our region. And it's, it's the same with the federal organizations. They are producing research and that public-private partnership between the two is very, very important right. to solve uh, problems. So find solutions mm -hmm. to problems. The entrepreneurship is we want to encourage people that if you have an idea or a concept, man, let's sit down and talk about it. You know, let's figure out if it's a viable idea or concept and how we can get it out into the market do the spin out of a new company. Good, so that's, that's perfect. You know, Ready talks about seven sectors um, that uh, when, when you look at this region, and this is a big region, so why don't you go through those seven sectors with us? Because some of those are particularly interesting to us as a technical college. So Great. What, what are those seven? So our seven sectors is, first of all, advanced manufacturing. Right. Um, again, that's new processes, new ways of doing manufacturing um, through uh, means of technology and other pieces. Uh, the second one is agriculture, and then the third one is banking and finance. The fourth one is energy. The fifth one is healthcare. Uh, the sixth one is information technology, in particular cyber security. Right. And then the seventh one is outdoor products and recreation because of areas like Teton County, Driggs, Idaho, and then Sun Valley, um, in the Chalice and Stanley area, their main economy is based on tourism. Um, and so we, we know that outdoor products and recreation uh, is important to the economic uh, ecosystem here in our region. 
So energy is a huge one. So first of all, talk a little bit about Ready's relationship to INL and, and contractors. Make it mm -hmm. make it broad if you like. But, sure. But what what do you think is important in that energy realm, and uh, what are you helping with there? So we are very involved because. Um, with energy being identified as one of our important sectors mm -hmm. and growth for the future. Um, we went on the trip to Plant Vogel, which was very insightful, um, <laughs> especially when you have 8,800 construction workers physically on site and you stand at the top of the tower that we did. All those stairs that we climbed were exhausting. They I think were. all of us found out how out of shape that we were as we'd have to climb a few and stop and then climb a few and stop but uh, so this was a cooling tower for those of you that may not know and, and you may not even know what a cooling mm -hmm. tower is here but w this is probably the last one that will ever yes. be built in the in the world but it is tall and quite impressive and but, it was uh, great to get on top and get, look over the project absolutely because it's to huge. me just going through each of the different areas that we did that were under construction you see the, the the pods of employees around, but you can't encompass the magnitude or the number until we stood on top of that tower and looked down and saw the mounds of cars that were parked in multiple parking lots. And then I think you really, um, to me, that 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 visual came into play of saying there are a lot of people mm -hmm. working on this project, and I think they were capping at ten thousand. Yeah. So they still had twelve hundred more people to bring into play. Um, from the energy sector here in Eastern Idaho, INL is doing a fantastic job of growing uh, the nuclear sector and cybersecurity. So they've, they've also diversified, which is really right. exciting to see that. Um, when we look at energy, we know that multiple companies will pay particular attention to Eastern Idaho because of these activities. And that interest will be their their ability to say, I want to be a partner. And those companies that probably would have never considered Eastern Idaho before, because of these activities, will now start to say, we want to come into Eastern Idaho and be a part of this. So it's a big economic player to our recruitment of companies coming in. Um, in addition to that, we formed a nuclear consortium, which you're a right. part of. Exactly. Um, right. And that nuclear consortium was really an opportunity for us to bring the managers of all of the nuclear companies together in one room and openly have open conversations about what are the projects, what are their timeframes for ramping up of construction? When are we gonna hit peak? When will it ramp down? When will the next one come online? We wanted to, to serve several purposes. Number one, we know construction workers will be um, in high demand. And so if we can bring in a construction crew that's working on, let's say, UMs, and that project stops and floors project or NRF uh, project begins, that construction company or employees can transition over. So we wanted to make sure that we, you know, we have an easy transition. Everybody's fighting for the same workforce. But then also it helped us to understand the magnitude of numbers. So the peak for these nuclear projects, as we know, 2024. It is. With 5,000 construction workers. And that's outside. not far enough out in the future. It makes us nervous. It, 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 and it's, it's close. tomorrow. It is. So, you know, with this nuclear consortium, it helped us to identify we're going to have um, um, some strains on our housing, we're going to have strains on our workforce, and we're going to have a, a, some strains on our infrastructure, especially the roadway going out to the desert. So, um, it, it provided an opportunity for us to really be strategic as leadership and everybody work together in one room and identify what's coming down the pipeline and how are we going to plan for it. And that is what's key for any region is planning for future growth, especially when you know what it is. There's some growth that's gonna hit you blindsided, it is. but this one we're keeping on top of to make sure it's not. And that all of these projects coming down the pipeline have all the resources that they need to be successful and make our region successful. So. so when you're when you're talking with the mayors and, and we had Mayor Coletti was was good enough to come in a couple of weeks ago and, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get Mayor Casper. We've a, invited her so we'll see her. But there, there's two uh, two sides to this expansion. One would be the build out and mm -hmm. the skilled trades. 
The other would be that ongoing operational full-time employees that are involved with that. And, and we as a college in particular are interested in that skilled trades. Mm -hmm. So the thing that amazed me, you probably would agree that when we were in Aiken, I've never seen so many motor homes and RV parks. <laughs> and I think that's part of the problem is not being ready for that growth. So maybe mm -hmm. a couple of questions here. So first would be, do you think we're going to recognize that and try to get that infrastructure in place? You know, the homes and uh, all of those components that go in, uh, in into construction and uh, just plain be able to uh, both train and attract a workforce in for those long term, um, uh, mm -hmm. the long term employees. So. Yeah, because I think, you know, even the short term, uh, when they when they go from project to project. Well, then it becomes long term because it's lot of, multiple years. Exactly. But yeah. they also fall in love with the area. Yeah. So some come alone. That's all they do is jump from project to project. Some come with families. Their mm -hmm. families go with them to these particular projects and they fall in love with the area and they don't want to leave. And so we need to make sure that we have opportunities for them to remain here and continue to 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 stay and grow um, you know, our, our region. But I think also um, when we look at the housing requirements for this project, we also know, and we saw this with the different trailers and uh, they're called man camps. We mm -hmm. chose not to use that verbiage at all. We are calling it the <laughs> nuclear housing support program. Good. Okay. So we are working with two communities right now that have an opportunity to do modular housing, to come in and set up these nuclear support housing programs in an area close um, to the project uh, where infrastructure can be brought in, modular systems set up, and then once the project is completed, the modular systems can be taken down, but the infrastructure remains behind for these cities and these counties to go in and develop it into maybe yeah, a housing you know, that, or that's so interesting I don't, I don't know that i was aware of that yeah so, so that is really that just transpired over the last 30 days okay good uh we we found out about these modular systems and so we reached out to two different communities butte county of course is open sure. to this type of a system and then also um atomic city uh through bingham county okay. is also interested in this and so those areas that they wanted to develop we're providing an opportunity where they didn't have the financial means to put the infrastructure in. We're now going to rectify that problem for them by putting the infrastructure in. So these modular systems that are developed through um, a company, they put the infrastructure in, they put the modular housing in, and then when they pull the modular housing out, the infrastructure sits there, and now the, the city or the county can go in and develop it. So it's a win-win. Yeah, that's a great a idea. And, and you don't end up with a trailer park that's there for 50 years. Correct. So that's a, that, that's a wonderful idea. Yeah. What? It's smart growth and smart development. You, you know, it is. And I, I again, I, I think with that group of us that went back, really, uh, especially for the cities to be thinking about this kind of thing, and they're going to be mm -hmm. most affected by uncontrolled growth. Right. What do you think... Um, what do you think the mix would be in training uh, existing employees for these, these, I think it's five projects, maybe big, bro mega yeah. projects. Six but, of the nine have been approved. The other yeah. three are going through NEPA. Okay. So we've got six mm -hmm. that, that are on the, that are for sure. What do you think the mix is uh, for us in uh, this Eastern Idaho region to train the workforce and then what is it we do to try to attract mm -hmm. the remaining in? So I, I don't know if you've looked at a ratio. We have, we, based on just the information that's been provided to us to date, 60% of the workforce is being assumed as coming in from out of state. 40% is being assumed as inside the state of Idaho to fill right. these jobs. So when we stop and think about it, we think about, 40% will fill the job. So where does the 40% come? Well, they probably come from existing jobs that they hold with existing employers. So now we've got to be really creative to say, how do we retain the current jobs for that employer so that mm -hmm. they are not impacted by 
the growth, whether it's the energy growth, the nuclear growth, or any type of sector that's going to come in and do what, what is happening right now with our nuclear sector. How do we retain and protect those jobs? And so um, we are forming an alliance in which we can work with manufacturing companies to help them to, to train and retain uh, their current workforce. Now, you're going to have those that will leave they, um, for they other opportunities. I mean, that just happens. But I also think it opens up, <clears throat> excuse me, a creative opportunity for us to say programs like Cradles to Career. Mm -hmm. These are individuals that, that through ever life's decisions um, and, and different things that happen in their life, maybe didn't uh, have an opportunity to finish high school or maybe they didn't have an op opportunity after high school to gain any skill sets. So we want to really go in and look at all of these different areas and say, there's opportunity here. We have an opportunity to change the dynamics of the workforce in our region. So why don't we pull leadership together and under the cradles to career, focus on working with CEI mm -hmm. to bring forward programs that will give them the skill set and certificates and an associate's degree to upscale their skill sets to make them um, um, employable for that, these types of jobs. You know, I, I, I really appreciate how well you know us. And, and again, we aren't going to be training those high end nuclear physicists or in any of those uh, kinds of positions that we're, we're not built to do that. That mm -hmm. isn't our purpose. Uh, but it is, I mean, even in high school or, or K-12, let's, let's even phrase it that way, at, at a sixth grader level to, to inspire those students into any number of different kinds of jobs. Yes. And uh, for a lot of our employers, exactly like you described, the, the, the good seasoned in, in employees get siphoned off mm -hmm. in, in, and, uh, and, and move into better mm -hmm. paying jobs. But uh, in a lot of respects, we're here to backfill them, whether it's in cyber, for example, or in the health professions, health physics, those, those kinds of things. Any, any number of those kinds of jobs, we're here at an entry level mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to be able to backfill. I, I love colleges. I, I've worked enough with them and and, and you and I have had this conversation that I think CEI is in such a, an amazing prime position right now because you are the most close related to the employer to quickly respond to their needs. Where working in a university system in multiple universities that I have, mm -hmm. it's, it's, very, um, it's very difficult for them to quickly change because of the systems that they have to work within, the constraints that they have as a university system, where you have more flexibility to quickly respond to an employer's need. And to me, that puts you in such an incredible position. Okay, again, it, it's so great to, to hear that. So that, that's the message we're mm -hmm. trying to get out and you're helping us with that. You know, there, I guess there are three kinds of skills and I'll, and I'll, I'll just have you reflect on that. So there are academic skills and that would be our associate of science, associate of arts. First two years of a baccalaureate degree, they move to a university. Then there are technical skills and um, that's a lot. That's everything that iTech did and, and most of what we do right now. And then there are soft skills. Mm. So you're with our employers and, and maybe you would just um, think a little bit about soft skills and what do you think we ought to be doing that would help our graduates to be great employees? I think the biggest concern that I hear from employers, uh, not only in Idaho, but different states that sure. I've been in, it's always the same message over and over again is that we do such a great job of educating these kids, but when they come to us, they don't have those soft skill sets. They can't communicate well. They can't work in team environments. And so I think that adding those soft skill pieces of kind of like a mandated general ed course or something like that is important to position them in different settings that they're going to encounter when they get into the real world. And so I think that should just be part of the curriculum that you mandate that there's various courses that they take in addition to those 
certifications or technical skill sets that require because again you can be really good at welding but we all know that when communication breaks down it's usually i'm telling you i'm explaining a system to you and in my mind i can see exactly what i'm telling you but between here and your brain we got to disconnect because your right. picture you're drawing in your mind and i love it when people get together in groups and they always say okay i'm going to explain to you um and a piece of equipment i'm going to have you draw exactly what i explained to you and this person has a picture of that piece of equipment and so when the person they're communicating to draws it up on the whiteboard and then they're through and they turn the picture over what you're seeing on the whiteboard and what that piece of equipment looks like don't even match up there's a breakdown of communication so it's really getting people to effectively communicate um, and make sure that the other person is seeing exactly the same picture that they're seeing. Yeah, so even though we're in summer and a couple of weeks away from starting, we've got a couple of faculty on here, and and I think we are good at hiring faculty who understand that. So it is a mix between those academic skills, those technical skills, and those soft skills, because we want these students, uh, when they graduate, to be successful. To, yeah. So we, we really should be turning over a trained workforce. And Michelle and her team do a lot of that um, as, um, as well. So what do you tell a, when you go out of state and, and maybe you're robbing from uh, Utah a bit, <laughs> but uh, so uh, what, do, what are you telling, what, what, what's the pitch for why um, this region to mm -hmm. either, either bring in employers? I don't know how much you're dealing in a, individual workforce, but some, but what, what do you tell them as to what's the advantage of Eastern Idaho? Because that's an important part of what you do. I really appreciate that because, um, you know, when I first came on board, I interviewed more than 50 um, business industry, university, um, and community leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of questions that I asked. They were very open in their responses. And one of the questions that I asked leadership was, if you were on a plane, and the person sitting next to you, like they always do, you start a conversation. They say, oh, where are you from? And you say, Eastern Idaho. Well, where's Eastern Idaho? <laughs> and what, what's going on in Eastern Idaho? <clears throat> so that was a question that I posed to more than 50 people. And every single person had a different answer for me. So we've got to train ourselves on preparing an elevator pitch so that when leaders are on that plane, I don't care if you're on your personal vacation, that question's always gonna come up. You're selling Eastern Idaho. Right. And so um, it's interesting you'd ask that question because these are my key strengths and assets. Okay. And these are always, these bullet points are always, when I talk about Eastern Idaho, I always talk about it's the second largest workforce in the state of Idaho. We have the fourth and fifth, fifth largest cities in Idaho, in Idaho Falls and Pocatello that 81.7% are under the age of 35, that's in Rexburg. Uh, we have the greatest four institutions of higher education, and I make sure I name every single one of them, which includes the College of Eastern Idaho, Yay. that we are home to five federal programs. And it's interesting to me, when I get to that point, they always say, you're what? A lot of people don't realize that, you're do they? You're exactly I, right. I'll, I'll bet a lot of our faculty and staff don't realize that there are five of these in our region. We have the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, Navy, the um, Federal Bureau of Investigation, and Homeland Security. To have five strong federal programs like that in one region is amazing. It is. And that right there is strength in itself. And so when I tell people about that, they're just, they're in shock. And then I Talk to them about, we have the largest DOE, Idaho National Lab, mm -hmm. site um, in, in uh, Idaho Falls. Again, shock. You're kidding me. I, I didn't know that. Um, and so it's kind of fun to kind of shock people a little bit, you know, because <laughs> you're just like, oh, this is so cool that they don't understand. So I think that when you communicate these points to them, you need to realize that you're marketing Eastern Idaho to them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you're the president of the College of Eastern Idaho or whether you're counseling students, it doesn't matter what position, we encourage any time that you are having conversations with people about Eastern Idaho, you market Eastern Idaho, because it's amazing how many companies are saying, 
and you don't know this, you land to the gate, they get off the plane, and guess what? If it's a CEO of a company, they're picking up their cell phone, they're calling their secretary and saying, I need to make a stop in Idaho Falls. There's some amazing things going on in that place. I've never considered that as a site for us to have a satellite office of our company or to relocate our company. I need to go take a look at this place. Sure. That's what we want to see happen. And that's a home run for you. Oh, absolutely. For all of us. Sure. Not just for Ready, well, but for well, sure. all of us. No, no. That, well, that's exactly right. This, this region is important. And something, uh, so we're from Oregon originally, and then um, uh, about 10 years in, uh, in Boise, so the kingdom of Ada, and then we <laughs> moved here, and it's been about five years. Everyone told me there's more affinity uh, in the Wasatch Front, Salt Lake, that area, than there was for Boise. And uh, I'm beginning to believe that now, but wh why, don't you, why don't you talk a little bit about why you'd think that within the same state that the affinity mm -hmm. would be on the west side of the state, but it, it really isn't. Yeah, I think the first thing that comes to mind is proximity. Sure. So when you look at our region, we actually are closer to Salt Lake City than we are to Boise. So it's two and a half hour drive for me from Pocatello um, to Salt Lake City, where it's a three and a half hour drive from Pocatello to Boise. Yeah. And so for whatever reason, that one hour difference just makes a big difference that it's actually easier for me to go to Salt Lake than it is to go to Boise. Um, but I also think that Utahns and Idahoans have similarities. Mm -hmm. I think, number one, the pioneer heritage that we have here in, in homesteading and settling our areas, I think, um, you know, brings us together um, in commonalities. Um, I think that we take risks. Mm -hmm. I think that's just kind of in our, in our nature, in our blood. Uh, we help our neighbors. We have strong families. Um, we're hard workers. We have strong ties and and uh, to agriculture, which happens on the Utah and the Idaho side. So I think that's really what makes us similar. But I also think at the end of the day, um, we're both humble and Utah has stepped out, not in a negative way of humility. They've stepped out of saying, you know what, we are doing some great things and we need to tout those successes. Sure. We now need to get Idahoans to do the same thing. We can still be humble about our successes but we really need to tell the story and tell those successes to the world, not just to the, you know, across the United States, but to the globe, mm -hmm. because we're a global society. And so our voices don't just reach across the United States and that's our borders is California to the East Coast. It's far outreaching to that. So we need to, to tout those successes and we need to not follow in Utah's past per se, but learn from the mistakes that Utah did when they were growing because we're going through that growing pattern now. And so learn from your neighbor's mistakes. Mm -hmm. Make sure you don't make the same. Um, and, and really um, show that this is the best place, not only to do business, but to get an education. So what you and I both know this, and it'd be interesting to see how you respond to it. But if you're a native here, mm -hmm. you may not want a lot of people from Utah or California or <laughs> from wherever to come in. You, you may not want to have this massive growth. What's, what's the answer to that? My answer to that is it's going to happen no matter what. You're never going to stop people from coming into your, to your area, into your city, into your region. Uh, Utah was like that at one time. I remember under Governor Huntsman, that when uh, governor was really pushing a lot of very innovative and dynamic programs that Utah had never tried before. Um, we knew that it was going to bring a lot of people, especially from California. So of course, everybody starts to make assumptions about their visualization of a person from California sure. and what it's going to bring to our area. Oh, we don't want that. We don't want our schools tainted, our neighborhoods tainted, blah, 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 blah. But I think that that's what makes human nature so incredible is because we learn to accept other people mm -hmm. and we learn to work together. And that's really what regional economic development is all about right. is bringing the diversity of different leaders together and working together to make our region great and accepting. And you may not agree all the time, but being respectful of other people's opinions. Um, and ways of life. And, and I think that that's really what makes a region strong is diversification. You want to diversify the economy and bring all these businesses, 
you got to have diversification of people mm -hmm. and the skill sets and their, you know, ways of life that they're bringing into an area. And uh, to me, that's areas that have done well, have been accepting of people and making it happen. So um, that, that's my two cents on no, that. that. That It makes perfect sense, you know, and I, I think you're never in a state of stasis. No. We're, we're either growing or we're shrinking. Yeah. There, there are plenty, part, plenty of parts of the, the country, especially the, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, urban areas that are yeah. beginning to bleed um, uh, population. And I'm glad you brought that up because I had a meeting a couple of weeks ago in a rural area and several of the leaders made comments about, you know, we just, we're happy where we are. Mm -hmm. We like things the way they are. We don't <coughs> want growth. We're just, you know, and we really started to peel that onion layer back and start to talk about let's, what does that look like? So let's make some assumptions here. You want your daughter and your son to remain in this community. Okay. So if, if things remain the same way, will they have opportunities exactly. to keep them here and their children and their children's children? So we're talking multiple generations. Maybe that's the way it was when everything was farming and everybody worked on the family farm, but our world has changed and that's just not reality right now. And so, you know, when you start to get to the hearts, especially of the women, when they talk about their child moving or their grandchild, yeah living halfway across the United States and not having access to them, you know, they start to say, you know what, maybe we do need to look at growth and diversifying our community and allowing others in. And so it starts to open that door of, I've been looking at this wrong. And by the end of the meeting, they're, they're actually apologizing for their um, lack of vision, so to speak, of, of not, uh, not wanting growth in their community. Right. And that's what we want to see. It's just to be open. You, you, you know us actually quite well. What, what do you think, given, given our mission of a, a two-year uh, technical and um, community college, what do, you, what do you think we ought to be doing that we may not be doing right now? Hmm. Nothing like free advice, Teresa. <laughs> so um, I think that um when i look at um cei um i made a couple of notes because i really appreciated um you know you allowing me to look at the questions prior to coming i i look at at cei as you have the ability to respond quickly to the market sure. and so when you respond quickly to the market what does that look like I need welders. And we had this discussion the other we, day. Okay. Well, quite regularly. So, we have that discussion is, you know, company that. calls you up and says, I need welders. Yeah. I love, uh, and I've heard you say this in multiple meetings. Don't make us guess what you need. I right. love that phrase because that's exactly what happens a lot of times when universities and colleges respond to the private sector. A lot of assumptions are made. Mm -hmm. They need a MIG welder, a TIG welder, or whatever welder it is. And so, okay, I need a TIG wielder. This is what a TIG wielder does, X, Y, and Z. So there's an assumption that's being made. Well, that may not fit the specific standards and capabilities that that business wants. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's, it's that custom fit program concept where you physically go out to the employer's site and you watch the welders and you're there with the instructor and the instructor that has a strong background in there can start to adapt and diversify the training that specifically accommodates the requirements from that particular employer. Because I can guarantee you, and you know this better than I do, you can go from employer to employer and look at the welders and there's differences in each one of them and that's what they require. The no, that's exactly right. And that's the difficulty uh, that we've got. So. Maybe you're saying the culture of being um, flexible and innovative is maybe one of our most important attributes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And your quick response to the marketplace. Um, I think, um, you know, just getting out, talking with um, industry and making sure that you've got the programs that adapt and accommodate and feel their needs. And so, again, from a university's perspective versus a college, you have the ability to do that. I also, and you and I've had this conversation multiple times, 
I really look at CEI as, uh, as a Utah Valley University. What an amazing place, huh? Who could have known? So why don't you real quick explain what Utah Valley University did? Yeah. So I, I, I loved Utah Valley University. Um, so this was a half a century ago. It, 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 it was formed in uh, 1941 as- you, you notice that Mike popped up. Look at this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Mike, Mary's we got this, there. right? Yeah, Mike hi, and I have had uh, <laughs> conversations about this as well. But, you know, it, it was established in 1941. And this is what people did not realize, a Central Utah vocational school with their primary function of providing war production training. Mm -hmm. So once World War II was over, here set this school where the training was no longer required. 90% of their funds were pulled out, which that's substantial yeah. um, for a vo vocational um, college like that. And so they really sat down and took a look at where do we want to go? What do we want to be? Where's the market? How do we run, run and respond? How do we want to educate? And this evolution started to happen where it was a vocational school and then it became um, known as the Utah Valley State College. It was the Utah Valley Community College. Mm -hmm. Then it became the, the Utah Valley College. In 1991, they had 8,700 students roaming the hallways. In 2002, so 11 years later, 23,000 students were enrolled. So visionary, yeah. preparing for the future, responding to the marketplace. And today in 2019, I don't have the, the current numbers, but in 2019, they had more than 40,000 students enrolled on their campus, brand new buildings, uh, bachelor and master degree programs were added to the curriculum. Um, you know, they've got so many different diversification of programs and, um, and degrees. But what's interesting is they outrank University of Utah for a number of students mm -hmm. and Utah State and BYU, their neighbor. But the other piece is, and this is where you are well positioned, where were they located? Provo Orem, mm -hmm. along I-15. Right. What's happening in Lehigh, Utah is Silicon Slopes, the tech explosion of Utah. What is happening here in Eastern Idaho? CEI is located in Idaho Falls, where and I don't know if you can use explosion and nuclear at the same time. I probably but wouldn't. <laughs> the explosion of growth, let's put it that way, is going to occur. And so you are sitting in a prime position, just like Utah Valley University. You know, it, it, and, and we've talked about that. It, it is remarkable, yeah. the similarities. So strangely enough, we are right up about 45 minutes. This goes really quickly. So, so one of the things I'd like you to end with is, is, is give us three leadership techniques that uh, you, you like. So what advice would you have for us as leaders? You bet. I, I think I'm so grateful that you asked me this question because it actually made me realize that years ago, early on in my career, I typed up Teresa McKnight's personal leadership philosophy. Okay, good time. And it's, it's a three-page document. I'm not going to go through the three pages, so I don't want everybody to panic going, oh my gosh, we're going to just set through this woman's three-page document. But uh, one section was my personal philosophy. The other one was I place great value in. Uh -huh. The other was I lead by. And the other one was the attributes I aspire to role model. And then the last piece was what I expect from others. Good. that I leave. Yeah. So I want to just talk about a couple of things in my personal philosophy. Number one, I believe solid values provide a strong representation of who we are. Always lead by example. I believe in being visionary, always thinking outside the box. I believe in supporting an environment that inspires greatness, greatness within an organization and to those you serve. I believe in leadership is all about inspiring individuals inspiring others to reach their goals, to stretch themselves, and to achieve extraordinary things. And the last one is I believe in commitment, commitment to others and commitment to giving more than 100% to any organization that you work for and collaborate with. I think those are wonderful. So, so there you go. Yeah, so it, it is, uh, it, it, it's good. And I've done this with every one of uh, our guests and they 
all have insightful leadership techniques. And quite frankly, leadership doesn't happen by accident. You, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up, you have thought about this for years and what goes into the stew that creates a leader. Absolutely. And, you know, as leaders, we need our own strategic plan, our own roadmap sure. of the type of leader we want to become. And so, you know, I had to blow the dust off of this because <laughs> it was put together so long ago, sure. but it really helped me to, to realize my path right, and not forget where I've been and where I'm going. Right. Well, Teresa, thank you so much for spending time with you us. Bet. What, a, what a pleasure to have you. And I'm so glad that I could introduce you to a lot of our faculty and staff. So we'll, Absolutely. Nice to meet everyone. Okay, so we're looking forward to working with Reddy in any way that we can. Thank so. you so much. And it's a pleasure, Rick. Absolutely. To always work with you. So all of you have a great weekend and um, looking forward to, we're getting close to in-service, not next week, but uh, <laughs> the following week. So we're going to have students on campus pretty quickly. So everyone have a great weekend. Bye, everyone.